All right, it is 12 o'clock. We are probably about to have the siren go off to tell us that our tornado sirens are working, but I will try to work around this. This is a good noise canceling microphone, so you should be able to hear uh, mostly okay. Today we're covering chapter five, which is on mood disorders and suicide. So this is just part one. Uh, I will talk about this in class on Monday um, and possibly also next Wednesday because this is a lot of stuff. Uh, mood disorders are you know, some of the most common things that people have as psychological disorders. So do you wanna make sure that guys are familiar with this uh, stuff? So we've got emotion, affect and mood, which are all, uh, people kind of talk about these as though they're almost interchangeable. There are some pretty significant differences between them, but your emotion uh, is just your state of being, your state of physiological arousal. And again, I'm not talking about sexual arousal specifically, uh, but it is kind of defined by your subjective state of feeling. So your emotional state is kind of how you feel. And we have six main emotions. Again, if you watch the old Pixar movie, Inside Out, um, that really is a good way. Uh, I've actually prescribed that as homework to some of the kids that I've worked with because it's just a real good uh, movie to help people kind of define their emotions. But we've got sadness, happiness, fear, disgust, anger, and surprise as our six main emotions. Of course, there are dozens of other things that you can call emotion, but those six things pretty much encompass most people's everyday experiences pretty well. Your affect is the pattern of observable behaviors that are tied into your emotions. So your affect has to do with your facial expression, your body language, your uh, 
vocal intonations, the pitch of your voice, the speed of your speaking, all of those things have to do with your affect. And those are really important parts of how we show our mood, how we feel. And the way that you talk, the way that you're holding your body, I'm sure all of you have seen people who were doing public speaking and clearly very, very uncomfortable with it and how their body language almost, I mean, I don't know about you guys, but when I see somebody who is clearly just absolutely terrified um, up in front of a group, it makes me kind of feel, I mean, I get empathetic and I start feeling uncomfortable on their behalf. Uh, I have seen, you know, different performances and different presentations. And I was just like, oh, bless their hearts. They are scared out of their wits right now. And people who are nervous and they're talking super, super fast. And, you know, those kinds of things that we can, you know, look at and go, okay, clearly there's somebody who's experiencing a lot of anxiety right now, or maybe it's somebody who's having a manic episode. Uh, So there are a lot of things like that that we look at as clinicians as well. Um, During that intake interview, again, uh, one of the things that I talked about in class on Monday was how you do that mental status examination at the end, kind of just checking all of those things. And one of the things that you do check are is for the affect and the mood. Now your mood is this kind of pervasive, sustained emotional response that people have. Mood is one of those things It can really affect your perception of everything. And we really kind of dichotomize mood as in we just go, well, somebody's really in a bad mood today or somebody's in a really good mood today. Mood is a lot more complicated than that. Of course, it's a lot more subtle and nuanced than that. But we do pretty much just divide it into you're in a good mood or you're in a bad mood. There's a huge middle range there for people. Uh, Most of us live somewhere in the middle a lot of the time. But we're talking about, you know, a combination of emotional, cognitive, and behavioral states when you're talking about someone's mood. And when you're talking about someone who is dealing with depressed mood, there's a lot of things that you look at to see where you've got someone who's, you know, got low energy, a loss of pleasure, um, they're tired, they're having trouble sleeping, um, they're just not enjoying anything that they used to enjoy, all of those kinds of things that would indicate clinical depression. Clinical depression and major depressive disorder have pretty much the same symptoms, but clinical depression yeah, is a broad term that is not a diagnosis. Uh, major depressive disorder is when you've got someone who's experiencing depression, depressive symptomology for at least two weeks. And that's a really short time span for most mental health issues. Uh, when you're talking about major depressive disorder, you're talking about people who have had thoughts and feelings of hopelessness, helplessness, worthlessness. They're, uh, you know, looking at uh, the past with regret. People who have anxiety usually looking at the future with fear. Uh, So those are two, you know, kind of easy things to look at for the difference. Uh, Feelings of guilt, feelings of regret, self-loathing, self-hatred, also really common in major depression, Um, low self-esteem issues, lack of energy, Uh, lack of appetite, having trouble sleeping or sleeping too much. All of these things are part of major depression. And it's one of the leading causes of disability worldwide. At any given time, you're talking about, you know, 10% of all disability is due to depression. That's a massive number of people that are suffering from this. Um, In the most severe cases, you can have people that are delusional, Uh, And again, when I was talking about the uh, medication treatment for people who have depression, very rarely you do have people who become psychotic because of their depression, but that is extremely, you know, not typical um, on that. 
Other kinds of symptoms that people may not think about as far as depression, you can have uh, problems with your sex drive, with concentration, with focus. So you can have some overlap symptoms of ADHD with depression, which is not something people typically think of as going together. Um, withdrawal from social situations is also extremely common for people who have depression, which means they could have overlap with some social anxiety disorder stuff. For children and adolescents, depression can often manifest as irritability. And for those of you who have dealt with adolescents, how in the hell do you tell the difference between a grumpy adolescent and a depressed adolescent? Because there are many adolescents who are just constantly kind of pissy and grouchy. How do you tell the difference? Well, the main thing is, is it a significant change from what they were like before, earlier? Now, when you're talking about, you know, like 12 year olds, 13 year olds, yeah, the puberty monster does its thing and it can change kids' behavior pretty significantly, but there's also a lot of times there's other things going on that are causing some of those uh, behavioral changes. Uh, the just the massive change, the onslaught of hormones that can influence behavior and, you know, all the changes that go along with that with puberty can also cause, you know, a lot of kids to struggle with body image, to, you know, feel really depressed. Oh, and God knows that these kids are, you know, online looking at Instagram and thinking they're supposed to look like those people that don't have pores. Uh, yeah, that's going to cause all kinds of, you know, self-esteem issues and stuff like that. So lots of things to look into there. But some of the main things that we look at with major depressive disorder, as far as symptoms, we've got anhedonia, which is the inability to experience pleasure, just not being able to enjoy yourself. Um, this is a very, very, very common thing in all sorts of depressive uh, you know, disorders. And anhedonia is a huge, huge red flag when you stop being able to enjoy anything that you previously enjoyed. I think all of us, you know, are kind of getting to experience the feeling, well, at least not everyone, but some, you know, most of us who at least, you know, don't believe conspiracy theories, you know, that are online uh, widely uh, know that COVID has changed the way we interact with the world and you know most of us are bummed out about that I you know miss being able to go out to eat and things that I did before I would not feel I still am not comfortable and I, I'm vaccinated but I still do I don't feel comfortable going to a restaurant yet um, especially not right now holy crap we have no ICU beds in Arkansas right now for COVID uh, yeah so you know and also honestly you know Arkadelphia is not exactly you know overflowing with wonderful restaurants and wonderful on ambiance and all that but you know I miss that is that a reason that I, is that why I'm depressed no I'm not depressed I'm just like oh well that sucks people who have depression can't enjoy anything they can't enjoy like watching tv shows and movies they used to enjoy or playing games that they used to enjoy uh, you know playing and working in their garden that they used to enjoy all of the kind of things that people do reading books you know all the stuff that people do for kind of hobbies and they stop wanting to do them they stop feeling like they can do them so that is a huge part of most people's experience of depression rumination is another issue Rumination is this thing that we all do sometimes. I mean, I do it sometimes. It's a preoccupation with negative thoughts. You think about something that sucks. You think about something bad that happened to you and it leads you to think about other bad things. And you get into one of those negative feedback loops and you start having all of these negative feelings you start feeling regretful, you start feeling guilty, you start feeling, you know, the helplessness, the hopelessness, worthlessness, all of those things that, you know, go along with maintaining depression. Rumination is a very, very strong part of most people's uh, depression. And this is something, I mean, again, it's totally normal for you to go through some of that sometimes, but for it to be like 
you know, a huge part of your day to sit around for four hours, just ruminating on all the crappy things that have happened in your life. That's not normal. That's not okay. Uh, doom scrolling is bad for us. And I have to stop myself from doing some of that stuff because, well, I mean, and it's not because I have depression. It's just because, well, the news sucks right now for the most part. Uh, there's an awful lot of stuff that's like, well, where do you find the good news? News outlets, unfortunately, you know, get a lot better ratings and a lot more clicks for posting, uh, you know, the bad stuff than the good stuff. So there's those kinds of things that can really, for someone who has uh, clinical depression, I myself lean towards more a being anxious than depressed, <laughs> but for people who lean towards depression, this rumination can really be a strong force in maintaining their depressive symptomology. So that is something else that people just need to be, and clinicians, of course, need to consider. Um, so there's that. So how do you distinguish clinical depression from normal sadness? Well, for one, the mood change is pervasive across all situations and throughout time. I mean, it doesn't go away. There's no break from it. Uh, when people are clinically depressed, they are just sad all the time. Um, they don't ever just, you know, laugh and they can't sit and watch a comedy and laugh and then go back to feeling crummy. Um, there are people who have, you know, very mild depression symptoms that, you know, don't enjoy things as much as they, you know, would like to or used to, but they can still at least momentarily get enjoyment out of things. That's not typically the case for people who have major depressive disorder. Um, the mood change, this is a big one. The mood change happens with no precipitating event. Nothing has happened that would cause someone to feel depressed. So that is another issue, of course, that needs to be considered. If you've been through some really negative things, if you've had numerous losses in your life, um, my daughter-in-law is a nurse practitioner at a big old hospital in Dallas. And she, one of the doctors that she works under it had three people in his family. He's from New York City. And this was early on in the COVID uh, crisis. He had three people in his family, including his father and one of his brothers die of COVID within a week of each other. Yeah, precipitating event, uh, yeah. So that would be a different kind of, you know, clinically significant issue than someone who is just depressed for no particular reason. And that's actually a hard thing for a lot of people with depression. When they don't have a reason for it, they actually feel worse about their depression because they're like, well, what the hell's wrong with me? I, my life is fine, my life is good. I have people who love me. I have a good job. I have enough money. Why do I still feel horrible? It's actually a little bit easier. I mean, I'm using easy as a kind of loose term here, but it's actually a little bit easier or more, uh, more sensible seeming for people to experience depression when bad stuff is happening. It's actually harder for you to kind of process cognitively what's going on when life is going fine and you still feel absolutely awful. So that's another uh, thing that we look at as far as distinguishing clinical depression from normal sadness. Also, is the depressed mood way out of proportion from the precipitating event? Now, obviously you have someone who has three deaths in their family within a week, that's going to be devastating. But if you have someone who goes into a deep, dark depression because they broke up with someone that they'd only been dating for two weeks. Yeah, that's not normal. That's not typical. That's, you know, that's not the way people, I mean, usually something like that, you know, but you know, you're talking about like teenagers that go through relationships, like, you know, most of us go through socks in a week. Um, yeah, those are the kinds of things that you would expect somebody to be able to, you know, kind of eat a pint of haagen and get over it, <laughs> just not, and not be devastated. Oh, never love again. Oh, I remember hearing some of my uh, high school age, like early high school, like ninth grade. Oh, I'll never be able to love anybody as much as I love Josh. And you're just like, oh, sweetie. <laughs> oh, honey, the next cute guy that walks, or the even semi-cute guy that walks through the door, you're probably going to be crushing on him in three days. <sighs> so those kinds of things can also be a part of it. 
impairment of functioning, as I mentioned in here before, one of the biggest indicators of something that's a diagnosable mental illness is the impairment of functioning. Does it interfere with your ability to function on a daily or near daily basis? A lot of people can feel sad and feel down and feel bummed and be grieving, but they can still function. They're still slogging through life. They're still getting up, going to work, going to school, doing the things that they need to do. They're still able to put on enough of a Oh, sorry, enough of a game face that, you know, they're functioning. Now, people who are in the midst of a major depressive episode, they can't even get out of bed sometimes. They, the thought of going to the kitchen and making a sandwich for themselves is overwhelming. That is a huge indicator of major depression. Uh, the TED talk that I have for you guys to watch, one of the ones, Andrew Solomon's, uh, is so good because this is somebody who's experienced you know, that kind of depression. And he describes it so very, very succinctly and eloquently uh, in what it's like to actually you know, have that kind of depression where the thought of going and making yourself a grilled cheese sandwich just is absolutely overwhelming. That's not the normal kind of sadness that people have. Um, and there's other kind of signs and symptoms. You have like physical issues that can go along with it. And this is an important thing to note. I always, 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 if somebody is presenting with depression symptoms, having a doctor check things out, especially if you've got someone who's really experiencing a lot of fatigue um, or other somatic bodily uh, symptoms, always good to have that checked out by a doctor. There are plenty of physical illnesses that can mimic or have the same symptoms as depression. Um, the kind of fatigue that people have, the trouble sleeping, the problems with concentration. These are also signs of like mono. These are signs of like you know, chronic fatigue disorder or uh, chronic fatigue syndrome, I think is what it's called. There are things that can definitely, you know, be physical causes for that. So again, that's something else to look at. And then uh, finally, one of the biggest things is the nature or quality of the change is just people feeling like they've got a dark cloud over them. They can't see that there's any good in the world. They can't see that things are going to get better. Uh, just that almost delusional thought quality, not to the point of being like psychotic, but just being unable to see this too shall pass if there's bad things that have happened to them, or if not bad things that, you know, that things are going to get better eventually. Um, that is something that can really be, you know, a distinguishing uh, characteristic between clinical depression and normal sadness. I have heard people with depression talk about how they just felt like they were in a hole in the ground that, you know, they were just waiting for the ground to swallow them up, that they just felt like a storm cloud was following them everywhere they went and there was no light in their life. Uh, so things like that, obviously, are pretty meaningful. Insomnia and hypersomnia are also really common uh, things that people with depression experience. Insomnia being uh, having trouble either falling asleep or staying asleep. And hypersomnia is sleeping too much. So yeah, complete opposite ends of the spectrum, but sleep difficulties are very, very common for people who have depression. So these are things that really do matter because when you don't sleep well, every aspect of your life is going to be impacted by that, especially with insomnia, because if you don't get enough sleep, you are zombie walking through the world. I mean, you're not trying to eat brains, but you are just, uh, you can't think straight. You can't function. You got no energy, just all of these things. So, and insomnia can be caused by other physical things as well. So again, you know, it might be worth going to a doctor to check those kinds of things out because there are a lot of, a lot of different things that can cause people uh, to have insomnia in particular. It has been a source of continual amazement to me how many people I have dealt with in clinical setting, um, well, and in you know, regular life too, that would complain about not being able to sleep. And, you know, they're talking about, you know, and then I ask about what kind of like eating habits, drinking habits, sleeping habits. And they're like, oh yeah, well with dinner, you know, they go through like a two liter bottle of 
caffeinated beverages every day and they're drinking a gigantic cup of caffeinated soda with dinner and they don't stop drinking it until 9 30 at night and then they think they're supposed to go to bed an hour later when they got all that caffeine running through their system and be able to sleep yeah so switch to decaf I mean, that's, that's a pretty simple thing hypersomnia is actually a more uh, common problem with people who have depression. They just want to sleep all the time because sleep equals no hurt unless you're having bad dreams, which is a whole other issue. Um, but it is quite common for people who have um, major depressive disorder to want to sleep, you know, 12, 14 hours a day. And that is definitely a problem. Uh, the right amount of sleep is variable from person to person. But, you know, generally, if you're sleeping more than nine hours a night as an adult, you know, 10 hours, absolute max, you know, unless you have some kind of health problem, of course, that is not normal and that's not healthy and that's not okay. So that's another thing that we look at. Now, dysthymia. I actually prefer the old word for this. It used to be called persistent depressive disorder. Uh, it is a milder form of depression, but it's longer lasting. So whereas major depressive disorder only requires two weeks of symptoms to be diagnosed, dysthymia takes two years for adults and a year for kids. So this is you know, a very long time to just feel lousy, to just feel sad, to feel bummed out. It's got pretty much the exact same cognitive mood, affect, you know, issues that uh, major depressive disorder has, but they're just not as bad. Uh, these are people who are able to get through life. They're able to slog through things. They just feel lousy while they do it. And a lot of people don't even realize that there's anything wrong. They just think that's life and that's how it is. And it doesn't have to be, but for a lot of people, they don't even seek out treatment because they just think that's what life is. And that's really unfortunate because there's a lot that can be done to make that better. So um, dysthymia is, again, just this longer lasting, less severe form of depression. Um, now, major depressive disorder is one that, you know, we have concerns about suicidal ideation. We have some concerns about people committing suicide when they're really depressed. Dysthymia usually does not indicate any of those kinds of concerns. But again, just quality of life issues that are, you know, pretty common with that. Uh, so Oh, and before I go further, at the end of my la my 11 o'clock class, my internet cut out on me when I was in the very last thing. It was only about three minutes from, from class. But if that does happen, <laughs> I will have a video um, of this and I will finish you know, that video or post it in part two or something like that um, if it cuts me off you know, from, from this point. But hopefully I'll be able to get through all of this. Um, I'm going a little faster just to make sure because... I don't know for my internet is usually solid here, but once in a while when it starts cutting out on me, it gets stupid and it cuts out several times um, in succession. All right, PMDD stands for premenstrual dysphoric disorder. Uh, this is one of the ones. There are a few disorders where I'm just going to be like, nah, this is bull and, and mm -mm, this is bull plop. So this is one of the ones that I kind of take, well, I take offense at not only as a woman, but as a clinician, because it is a freaking catch all. There is so, so much in here as far as potential symptomology. Okay, so this is a severe form of premenstrual syndrome or PMS. Um, that supposedly affects about 2% of women, and it's primarily the week before your period, um, and the symptoms go away shortly after you start your period. On average, it lasts about six days of your cycle. Okay, the problem that I have with this is the symptoms that they've listed here from the DSM. Labile mood, which means moody, like your mood is all over the place. Substantial disruption to personal relationships. You're being a bitch. Yeah. Um, anxiety, anger, depressive symptomology, feelings of sadness, despair, thoughts of suicide, feelings of tension, anxiety, panic, mood swings, frequent crying, lasting irritability. And this is my favorite. Anger that affects other people. 
So you can be mad at yourself and that's fine. But if you're mad at other people, you know, because there's no possible reason that you might get mad at somebody else. Yeah. Uh, lack of interest in daily activities, relationships, i.e. I don't want to have sex with you right now because my boobs hurt. Uh, trouble thinking, focusing, tiredness, low injury, energy, food cravings, binge eating, trouble sleeping, feeling out of control, physical symptoms like bloating, breast tenderness, headaches, joint or muscle pain. Now, could you be more all over the place here? So you're anxious or depressed. You're panicky and you have mood swings. You have trouble focusing. Holy crap, that's like 12 different potential mental health diagnoses right there. And a diagnosis of PMDD requires the presence of five of these. Um, I had like 12 of these this morning and I'm 55. I am not premenstrual, thanks. Mm. Uh, so what the actual crap is this? Um, having some premenstrual discomfort and, you know, feeling crappy is not a mental illness. It's dealing with all of the, you know, hormonal changes that go along with having a menstrual cycle every month. Now, are there women who really do have a rough time of it? Yeah, there are. Um, there are physical things. When you are physically uncomfortable, are you more likely to be kind of cranky? Yeah. Um, I don't know about, you know, the rest of you, you know, ladies who menstruate or people who menstruate out there. I had horrible cramps when I had my period. I would get bloated. I would feel really crummy physically for a few days beforehand. Um, did it mean I had a mental illness? Did it make me cranky sometimes? Yeah, underwire bra and bloated boobs. Yeah, not a great combo. <sighs> so yeah, there's some of that that just so smacks of sexism to me that it just ticks me off um, a bit because it's like, good grief, this is a bunch of psychiatrists who went to medical school. What? How is this not uh, something that would have been thought a little better of than to put a list of symptoms that could include damn near anyone, male or female, or somewhere in between? Um, so there's that. I would never use that as a diagnosis for someone. I just cannot imagine. If you are having problems that severe because of your menstrual cycle, then I would think the first person to talk to and be examined by would be a gynecologist. And after that, an endocrinologist to find out what the hell is going on with your hormonal system to cause that kind of disruption and upheaval in your life every month, because we have to deal with this, most women, you know, for approximately 40-ish years. Um, if you're having problems that cause you to <clears throat> basically have a mental illness a week out of every month, what the hell, you need to get some treatment for that. And I know for, well, myself and plenty of other women, I mean, being on birth control pills made a huge difference on that for me. Uh, so yeah, there's all kinds of things that are, you know, just part of biological existence as being, you know, one sex or another. And some of it, you just have to, you know, learn to, to accept and live with, even when it sucks, like having cramps. I mean, I had cramps that felt like labor pains. I had six hours of labor with my second child, even though he was born by C-section and he was, a, and I knew he was going to be born by C-section, but I went in labor in the middle of the night and the doctor didn't get there. And yeah, so um, menstrual cramps and labor cramps feel the same couple of weeks ago, I was watching some videos on YouTube. Um, it, there apparently is a menstrual cramp simulator out there and some women were putting it on the men in their lives. And it was kind of hilarious, frankly, watching uh, these guys having these electrodes that are put on their bodies set on like a three and they are falling out on the floor going, oh my God, how do you function? And they're like, oh, that's not even bad. And these women are putting these things on and they're cranking it to a 10 and going, well, yeah, it hurts. And the women are just stoic as hell about it because it's what we have to deal with every damn month. So, you know, 
when you talk about something that, you know, half the population roughly has to deal with for 40 years of their lifespan, and then want to call it a mental illness, eh, that irritates me a little bit. <laughs> so there's just that. Seasonal affective disorder or SAD. Oh, is there a better acronym for a mental health issue that makes you sad than sad? Seasonal affective disorder is basically a kind of a depression, depressive disorder that's brought about by changes in season. <coughs> and one of the main therapies for it is just getting more light. Um, it is much more common in places where winters are dark and dreary and the days are short and the nights are long and the sun's only out for a short period of time per day. Um, Scandinavia, Northern Europe, um, you know, nor the Northern parts of North America, like in Canada, where you only get daylight for you know a few hours a day, even on a, the rare sunny day, because most of the time it's cloudy in the winter time and it's snowing. And there are literally places in the world where they can go months without getting you know sunshine for more than you know an hour or two. It was actually quite surprising to me, being that I'm you know I've lived in the South. Well, I've lived in Texas, Louisiana, Alabama, Arkansas um, in my life. And I was really good friends with a woman who was from the middle of Belgium uh, when I was, uh, when my husband was in grad school and she was so amazed at the difference in the sun that was available in New Orleans in the wintertime compared to what it was in her, her home of uh, Louvain, which is, uh, I think about two hours from Bel from Brussels. And she talked about how, you know, the sun would come up at 11 and go down at three during the winter. That kind of blew my mind. I did not realize it. I mean, that was a long, long time ago. I was like 23 when I started that job, but I had no real thought to like, oh my gosh, it is really that different. You know, in New Orleans, I think the shortest days are like 10 or 11 hours of sunlight. So that was something that was quite a, a shock to her as far as like, oh my gosh, it's so sunny all the time here. And I'm like, yeah, honey, wait till the summer gets here. Uh, it's miserable. But not having sunlight affects people's mood. It affects how we feel. There are very clear reasons that people are more likely to experience depression in Seattle than Honolulu. And a lot of it has to do with just sun exposure. And while sun exposure can be very bad for you as far as, you know, like skin cancer and, you know, photo aging and those kinds of things, at least for, you know, those of us who are, are pigmentally impaired, uh, it is definitely something that we really need for our mental health. So that is something that is a kind of interesting aspect of, you know, where you live. One of the cool things about seasonal affective disorder is to, if there's a cool thing about someone having a mental health issue is that it's very easily treatable by largely by using sun lamps. Um, you can buy these lamps on like Amazon for like 80 bucks and you, it's not a tanning bed. It's not those kinds of lamps, but they actually mimic sunlight. And the main, one of the main treatments for seasonal affective disorder is just sitting under one of those lamps for a couple of hours every day. I mean, I wish everything was that easy to treat. And, you know, you do that for a couple of weeks and people will feel much, much better. So, you know, I wish we had something that simple and that inexpensive for, you know, all of the mental health issues that people experience. So there's that. All right, and postpartum depression. Is depression with onset four week, within four weeks of childbirth? Also within four weeks of having a miscarriage, especially if you're talking second to third trimester miscarriages. Uh, so, which, you know, being depressed after miscarriage is certainly understandable, but after giving birth, when we are pregnant, our bodies produce more hormones than the rest of our lives put together. So the hormonal onslaught that happens for us to become pregnant, for us to maintain a pregnancy, for us to give birth and then become the, you know, the milk cow for your baby uh, is tremendous. And that hormonal onslaught can really affect people's overall functioning. Also the demands 
of new parenthood are massive. I don't know how many of you have taken care of a baby, but taking care of babies is very, very time consuming and it can be very hard. Um, well, I mean, I'm not going to say any, anything that should be a big surprise, but you know, I, babies are not my thing. Um, I, I, you know, I, of course I loved my children, but hey, um, babies are a lot of work. And when you have a newborn, you're recovering from childbirth, depending on what, you know, how your birth experience went. Uh, you may have stitches in very tender places. If you have a C-section, you're recovering from major surgery. Uh, your body has just gone through a massive, massive change in both shape, size, and um, you know, production of you know, milk and all of those things that happen right after you have a baby. So that can certainly wreak havoc on your mental state. The lack of sleep that is extremely common with new parenthood is also going to affect your mental health. Uh, so it can last for months after delivery, it can last even four years. If you are someone who already has struggled with depression, it is going to be something that they really need to look out for uh, as far as your postpartum experience, because it's more likely for you know people who have previously experienced depression to have postpartum depression. It can be really, really devastating because it can affect how you bond with your child. It can affect how you deal with that child in some really meaningful ways. So it's a very, very important thing. When I had my kids back in the eighties, nobody mentioned anything about postpartum depression to me after I had my kids. There was not a screening, not, not one mention of it. I have a three and a half year old grandson and my, my daughter-in-law is a nurse practitioner and I was asking her about it. And she's like, oh my gosh, they were asking me every single time I went in through the last trimester and all of my postpartum uh, visits about how I was doing and they were doing screenings and all that. And I'm like, oh my God, that's wonderful. I'm so glad to hear that because that's a really huge thing. And societal pressure on new mothers a new parents are so huge. You're supposed to be thrilled. You're supposed to be so happy. Oh, your little bundle of joy. Well, not to be, you know, total like negative downer about it. For a lot of people, having a baby is not a joyous experience. Their bodies just got completely trashed. Um, they're exhausted. Uh, they may not have realized how much work it was going to be to take care of one little 10 pound person, but it's a huge amount of work. Your life situation may not be that great. I, you may be doing it on your own or your partner's a jerk, um, or you went through, you know, physical difficulties during the birth process that are causing you to be in pain all the time, uh, for, you know, a while after you give birth, just all sorts of things that could affect how people feel about having had a baby and you know what's the pregnancy plan was it unplanned you know all of those kinds of things so it is something that needs to be screened for it is something that can really be a lifelong problem between the you know child and the parent so it is a very important issue to just address uh, sooner rather than later it is treatable, completely treatable. It's as treatable as any other kind of depression. Uh, it is something that you know really needs to be addressed by both a mental health professional and the obstetrician uh, of the person who just had the baby because uh, there's probably some uh, issues as far as like, if you're gonna try medication, there are some kinds of medication that are better than others. If you're breastfeeding, there's that additional issue, things like that, but there is support available certainly. And there are so many women that go through this and they don't talk about it because they feel ashamed. I should be happy right now. I've got this beautiful child and everything and they feel terrible. So again, 
you know, the shame and uh, self-loathing and all that goes along with depression is also part of postpartum depression. And then there's all the other, you know, hormonal changes and body changes. And oh my God, this whole societal thing about women supposed to bounce back after you have a baby within, you know, a couple of months is just lunacy. Um, that's such an unrealistic thing. It took nine months for your body to get to that point. You should give yourself at least that much to even get close to back to where you were um, before. If you ever do, I mean, you just made a person. That's something that, you know, people should realize is like, that's kind of a big thing for your body to have done. And you should not think that everything's going to go back to how it was as far as the way it looks. You get stretch marks, you get scars. I got a 12 inch scar across my belly from having two C-sections. Oh, well, I mean, I hated it when I was younger. Now I'm just like, yeah, okay, whatever. <laughs> but again, you know, that can be really hard. Uh, so things like that that need to be considered. For uh, your assignment, I got a couple of TED Talks for you guys to watch and some questions for it, you know, pretty straightforward stuff. So make sure you get that done for Monday. We'll continue with Mood Disorders. We'll talk about the bipolar side of things. And y'all have a great rest of your week and I'll see y'all on Monday.